if I remember, like, I don't know how long was, like, well, one minute, like, whatever was it, one second, 10 seconds, but that was actually the part where I felt absolutely in control and said, like, this is mine. Like, I got this. Like, it was kind of the same experience that I experienced the day, the three days before that I was practicing uh, while, while learning how to breathe. So when I, when I got into that point, actually, I don't know, but I think after that, I was just more like, okay, I think I know where I am. I feel where I'm going and this is in my hands. Like it's absolutely in my control. So it's been like, actually it's been changing a lot of things for me, the, the meditation, and it is something that have changed my mind. Welcome back to the Yogi Triathlete Podcast. We are Jess and Beej, and each week we share meaningful conversations with the endurance sports world because behind all the data and information is a sacred human being. Professional athlete or not, high performance coach or not, yogi or not, it doesn't matter. Our humanity levels out the playing field. There is no one more important than another. And we are committed to bringing you more of the uniqueness that is being expressed behind each name. Today, we have one of those amazing beings with us and someone who is no stranger to the YTP. Rodrigo Romero Garcia de la Cadena is also known as Troy. He is a professional triathlete and coach based out of Puebla, Mexico. He's been with us for episodes 63, 64, and 110, all of which are linked up in the show notes for this episode. But it was the very first interview with Troy back in 2016 that revealed to us something very special. And that was his mindset and character that is undoubtedly contagious and something that we want to spread more of within this community. We're so excited to have him back with us today and catching up with this relentless athlete who is en route to his dreams. Troy, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks. Thanks a lot. It's always a joy to be here. And I mean, it is every time that we get connected, it is a little bit more easy to just flow we did the, about whatever we want to talk and i think we we have a lot to sh- a lot to share together so thank you so much it's a joy yeah so um Beej, you want to start this off you were saying you wanted yeah, to start so, it off with a little recap yeah i was checking out your the first podcast we did together which took place in boulder yeah um 2000 and 16 16 17 it's 2017 okay yeah um no, it was 2016. We were on our tour, but we didn't release it until oh, 2017. Right. Okay. Yeah. And you were preparing for your first Olympic triathlon ever, first Olympic distance. Yeah. And you... No, you're so right, Troy. It was 2017. It was 17. Yeah, I was going to say... The whole like, incro is incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> Never question and, the guest. The guest and, is always and, correct. And, and, and you know what? I don't know if we've been three times in the podcast together. I think this is the third time. No, like, no, that you are wrong. We did Santa Rosa. Because we Smackdown. did down. Santa Rosa. Before Santa Rosa, we, we, it was when was the podcast. And then Santa Rosa. And then Boulder. Oh, Two. right, right. Yeah, yeah. I forgot okay. that. Okay, that so the score is 1-1. One, one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that yes. love? Is yes. that love or is it 0-0 zero, zero is love? Hugs and... No, not hugs. <laughs> tennis. Oh, tennis is love is zero, zero. Oh, okay. Well, Yogi Triathlete Podcast, one, one to one is love. <laughs> oh. All right. So go ahead, Beach. Yeah. Now that we got that figured out. <laughs> so I... I uh, there's so much good information in that first podcast. It was when we first had, had met you and um, you were about to turn pro. You weren't pro yet. Um, yeah. So catch us up just briefly. You know, I know that's been like a few years, but... Uh, what's transitioned over the past, you know, few years in terms of your professional career as, as a triathlete and how have, um, how have things gone? Oh, well, um, this year things have been amazing, different, but amazing. It's been great. Uh, but the years before I turned pro, it was, uh, a little bit hectic because I didn't know exactly what to do. You know, like, uh, I knew I was in the right path. I knew where I was going but I didn't know how it was gonna turn into the making, you know? I don't know if this makes sense, but Mm -hmm. like on the go, I didn't really realize like how it was gonna, if I was gonna be able to manage everything. Um, My biggest concern always, and and I don't like to say it as a complaining, but it it is my biggest 
um, challenging part is always um, uh, the money wise to know like how I'm gonna make it to this race or if I can be if I'm gonna be able to keep paying my my coach or you know like making a living out of it um, so um, you know we talk on that both podcast uh, since 2014 15 I knew I, w- I wanted to become pro but I didn't really know what it was gonna be the the process like um, then I turned into uh, starting training with city and then uh, living a little bit more closer with the pros and really knowing that how is to be a professional athlete like uh, 24-7 and it's not just uh, maybe swimming, biking and running some days and some other days you might rest and you know like so that was pretty hard to really understand and and actually learn the process during the process um, and then right now I can say that luckily I had all these little tests behind before every single before I did the big jump you know like and actually I, it is amazing because I think it, we, as we always say is there's no coincidence but uh, in Santa Rosa which was one of my peak performance till now uh, we were together and then in my first pro race we were together like it was kind of meant to be so actually that um and I, i'm gonna say something else uh later on the podcast um but like right now i'm trying to get better at to be honest on at a lot of things um you know um since i started doing uh well i make my own team and, uh, and right now i'm fully time coaching and training so i'm trying to get better at managing the team better and better and gi- giving the guidance the guidance that people need to and it's a lot of commitment a lot of responsibility so i'm trying to get a little bit better on that managing thing uh the timing i'm trying uh talking a little bit of training wise i'm trying to get a little bit better of being more efficient on the work which has been a lot of uh a lot of learning process because uh julie i changed i switched coaches so right now i'm working with julie Devens and julie has another type of training and i might be moving a little bit forward a little bit faster of what we wanted to talk but um it is it is new new things a lot of new things and i'm learning and actually i'm trying to get a little bit more efficient on the the, the timing even that i'm training and training a lot of hours now that I didn't use to, I'm getting a little bit more efficient also on those times, uh, on those hours. So, and the master piece behind of everything, it is actually the, the mental side. Like, uh, I've been always passionate and actually so, so like, so excited to see how the the mental side works for everything. Like not only athletes or endurance athletes, endurance athletes. So I always been reading a lot of out and from now I'm trying to start practicing a little bit more. So that's kind of the learning process also. So a couple of things that I want to touch upon, of course, we want to talk about the mental piece, but when, when you were saying like the unknown, you know, like not knowing if you can, you know, travel and, you know, the income basically really making this as an athlete, but you still keep moving forward. You, you obviously keep moving forward, but how do you do that? Like when there's so much unknown, like, am I gonna, am I gonna be able to make this happen? Or is this going to happen for me in my life the way that I dream? and having so much unknown, but keep moving forward anyway, despite what the bank account looks like. Like, how, how do you do that? What, how does it work for you? First of all, um, my brother says that it's my, uh, like, uh, quality to have, to not really worry about it. And it might sound like, yeah, whatever it might happen is it is going to happen. And it is not like that, actually. Like, I might make it look like that but it's not like that it's just to be sure that it's gonna happen you know like actually attract with the energy of saying like there is no dope this is gonna happen like i'm really kicking my ass every single day uh somehow this is gonna happen like i'm I'm not sure how it's gonna happen i'm not sure how i'm gonna get there um but i'm sure i'm gonna be there and i'm gonna be racing like it's it's it it is pretty hard to explain because um it's nothing that 
you read and you say, okay, tomorrow I'm going to fly and I'm going to have this and that and shalala. It is more like a good, you know, like you just feel it like, like, and actually it, the opposite side also happens. Like when I know it's not going to happen, I know it's not going to like, it, it, it might sound a little bit crazy, but I just trust a little bit more of my in intuition on that side. So I can just list a lot of different situations, but uh, the most recent one, it was uh, before Patagon, man, I got sick and I didn't have my tickets. Uh, Chile was having a, a rough situation about uh, uh, like a civil a small war and there was no flight. It's supposed to be super uh, extremely dangerous to travel and sh and a lot of things. And I was just like one week before the, the, I was planning to travel with all this situation. And I was sick on the couch, like looking at the news and really thinking like, should I, I don't have the money on my pocket right now, but I need to talk to the sponsors. Should I buy the ticket? Should I not buy the ticket? Uh, should I book my Airbnb? Should I not? Like so many different things. But at the same time, I was just like, Let's just give it a shot. I know it is going to happen and I know it's going to be a great adventure. And what could be the worst thing to happen? It's like you might spend like a couple of bucks, multiple bucks uh, on a ticket. <laughs> and, or, or you could get stuck in the middle of a civil war, you know. Ac that, <laughs> that, actually, that was the other case because I was talking with people over there. Uh, my girlfriend is from Santiago and, and I was talking to the race director before anything. And the race director was like, no worries, everything's gonna be fine. Like the chaos <laughs> is in Santiago, everything's fine. But you need to get to Santiago to fly it out to, to, to Patagonia. So it was kind of uh, a rough time and multiple times happens for Kona, for example, Kona 17, uh, I didn't have my, my anything booked uh, two weeks before the race. And so it is, it is hard to live with, um, but you just need to turn that switch off of saying like, how am I going to make it and trust to really one on a side, your, the universe and what is meant to be in another way, in another side, I would say also what you're working for, you know, so stop attracting the negative part. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Stop attracting the negative part. One of the things that you do so well is that you, you don't entertain the doubt. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean that it probably creeps in, but you don't entertain it and you nullify it. And that's the thing that prevents us from really attaining what we want to attain in this life is that we send out that desire in the world and we take the action in the direction of that desire. And then we start to entertain the doubt. And that's when some things work out, some things don't work out. Um, the other thing you've got is kind of a natural attunement to your intuition, which is, which is really amazing. And, um, also you've now got experience with not having anything booked two weeks out from Kona. Um, you know, not have any being sick and not have anything booked coming out from Patagonia. So would you say like through the experiences that you've had and the way that you've rolled through those experiences that the experience itself kind of makes it easier? Like, Oh, I've been here before. Yeah, definitely. Um, it makes it a lot of, uh, way easier, but it never stops being scary. You know, like it never stops to be a little bit panicking, uh, to get you into a panic position. Um, like I said, like, um, Kona 2017, uh, it was the hardest one, to be honest. Like I had no kidding, like 20 bucks in my pocket and survived like practically like three weeks with the, those 20 bucks in my pocket, like long rides and everything. I tried to carry everything with me cause I did grocery shopping like one month behind and I still have bars and the sponsor things uh, from protein and everything. So I was just fueling my pockets every single ride because I knew those 20 bucks, it was like kind of my last chance to use, you know? And then suddenly um, I had two options that moment, actually. Um, one, it was just to take a flight from Boulder in that moment back home and no flying and maybe try to find out how to get from Mexico to Kona eventually, uh, like three weeks out or four weeks out when was that was the situation. 
or the other to us to keep taking the risk actually and see if I can. So I, of course, I wasn't alone. Andres was there. Uh, Ellie was there. People wa were there with me, and people I knew if I need so anything, they will be there for me, which I'm really grateful. There's no no words to describe that. But at the same time, you know it is risky. Like you know, like what is like? How can you be really sure it is gonna happen? So I said, like, let's just push it to the very end. Like to the like, if it's just like one week before Kona and things are not changing, I'm just gonna fly back to Mexico and whatever it, it happens, it is fine. But I that will be a lot of fulfillment to know that I took it to the very last moment to take that chance because. It is how it is. But right now, if it happens again, I know I will find a way. Like it is just to trust that I can find a way. And as I said, if I have the good and I know it is not the right thing, I might just turn back and say like, this is not smart and let's just move to another point. And that's the, that's the thing that keeps us safe, right? The safe choice, the fly home, the uh, I don't have the money. I'm, where am I ever going to get it from? So I might as well just play the safe, the safe route. And then we condition and strengthen that same decision process, right? So yeah. we keep spinning that way. Whereas um, what's important is you you realize it's it's a risk, right? It's yeah. it's not life or death, but it's a risk in the situation that you're in as a aspiring uh, elite uh, athlete, professional athlete. And if you don't allow yourself to experience the highs and lows of whatever it is that your decision takes you when you risk it, then you're doing a disservice to the momentum that you're creating to, to bring you to where you want to go. Yeah. Because you, you already know, and a lot of us listening, um, to this are probably thinking like, oh my God, he waited till like two weeks for Kona. Like <laughs> nobody waits for two weeks because lodging and how, like they don't even know how they're going to get to the race. All those things can keep coming up and the safe route is to back out. But, but what we're saying is keep feeding that decision-making process to follow your heart, right? Follow that, that heart and that tug to bring you to the point where you're riding the edge because yeah. you, can't, you can't reach or we all can't reach where we want to reach if we play it safe. Yeah, never. It's never going to happen. And actually, I feel that um, the effort that you put into this situation of, I will call it a little bit more of a surviving mood, actually, because you are like kind of surviving, of course, not because you cannot breathe or because you are you have nothing to eat or it's kind of surviving because you don't know what is going to happen exactly. But like if we think about uh, periodization of the training, if it, this happened four weeks out of the race, my key session or a lot of my key sessions were in this period. And we know that is where the body has more stress and you don't need to stress more because you have to be worried if you are going to fly or not uh, to the race. So with this said, I, what I wanted to clarify it is that I use it as a fueling. For example, I completely, it's like yesterday, like I, I, I remember perfectly running my, my miles reps, thinking about like, okay, work for it. Like literally, like if you really want it, just work it out. Like, but now here, like push these miles harder and show like not, 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 you don't need to show it to anybody else, but yourself to say like, you, you are earned it. You have earned it. It's like you, you deserve it. So I feel like that's kind of the way of, you can also use it as a feeling, but it's not, it's never, uh, stop being scary. <laughs> right. But the, the response that you have to what's scary is your choice, right? You can use it as a way to fuel your fear, or you can use it as a way to fuel your training and fuel your dreams. Yeah. Because if like BJ said, I mean, it's, it's, it's so true that if we're not willing to push the edge, if we're not willing, not only push the edge, but like go over the edge sometimes, if we're not willing to do that, then we're never going to reach where we want to go um, in this life. You know, what, what, whether we want to be a millionaire or we want to be the world champion, it, it doesn't yeah. matter. We've got to be willing to like work for it. And the working for it is, um, is pushing, is pushing that edge.
pushing that edge and trusting. What about trust? Like trusting, and you've mentioned some of my favorite words so far, universe and, en <laughs> and energy. You know, I love those words. Um, the, what about trust in that? Trust that like, you know, there is, the universe loves you, right? Trust uh, in, yeah, uh, on your path. What does that, what does that mean to you to trust? Oh, well, I feel that trusting it is, um, isn't as hard as it sounds or as it looks uh, as people think will be. Like, I don't know, uh, trusting the the process, trusting your coach, tr like talking about a little bit more of the athlete side, um, trusting that you have made the right choice, maybe turning two levels down one day, one session, because you were not feeling right. So trusting a little bit each day more of what is your good telling you to to know or to 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 learn i think it is something pretty important but um i always say to my to my athletes and a lot of persons that they are with me that if we don't have trust to each other to somebody like whatever they are doing if it's just somebody maybe uh like a teacher or whatever we wanted to say like we have nothing to give or to earn uh, to anybody. Like um, it is, I think it is the most important uh, element in any relation, like any type of it. Like, cause sometimes, and this is quite tricky. I, I don't know, it might, I, might, I, might, I might be wrong, but if you don't trust, it's cause you might act the way that you, you are thinking the other person is gonna act like, your athlete or or your girlfriend your friends or whoever you you connect with you know so i think trust it is like it's just one of the elements it has to be there like in any way that we we need to apply it yeah how uh, how much do you trust yourself right now right now pretty much <laughs> since i got uh like well 2018 after the after boulder we had the podcast you remember guys and after that race i got uh injured um i had my tbls uh tendinitis on tbls and from there i had to really learn how to trust my feeling like to know this is painful or am I just scary? Or this is my body telling me that something it is not right or actually it is my inner voice telling me to stop. Or like, you know, like, and right now, um, for example, there was a couple of times where I felt pain and I was just like, nah, that's, that's, that pain isn't that bad. And then there were days where it was pretty bad and I knew there was something different. So I was trusting my body actually saying that mm, it's trying to tell me something. Went to the, uh, went to do an MRI and there was actually something wrong again. So trusting that it is uh, like learning how to trust. It is quite hard. I think it is a discovery process, like, cause sometimes you need to be quite hard to yourself to really say it like, no, this is you are saying this is to yourself. This is a story that you are telling to yourself, but what is it actually? So it is quite hard to really, um, read that in between the lines. But if you don't trust that, you know, exactly you are giving your hundred percent or your 50 or your 60. So if you are not actually true to yourself, it's, it's, it's way harder than it can be. And I think experiences, I think injury <clears throat> is one of the greatest experiences for us athletes to have um, as a practice to increase our trust. Yeah, absolutely. Like, actually, it is, uh, well, at least uh, what I can say right now, it is a long, long learning process, uh, which helps at, for us. Actually, as a coach, I can, I think BJ can say that also to say like, okay, this happens to me and I, how can I prevent this to my athletes to not happen the same thing? So, um, if it doesn't also help you, it helps to you actually it helps to somebody else around you. So yeah, it is, it is painful in the, all the way of the sentence. Uh, but it is great. Oh, actually it is a good opportunity to, to grow and to experience something different and actually to, to really 
um, understand how important things are for you. Like, for example, right now that it's been two to three months without running for me, and which is one of my elements, actually, it is just like how much I miss running, you know, and right now I can run 20 to 15 minutes to 30 minutes. And it's just like relief, like absolutely. And I'm so grateful for being able again to run. So yeah, actually, the, I think injuries isn't that isn't as bad as we think, I think. No, no. And we, when we have to experience them then for that very reason, Troy, because, you know, I'm in, I've been in similar situations and you realize how much you love what you do. Right. And then you're coaching these athletes and, and they love what they do too, but then you find them having to struggle to get on the other side of the door to actually do a session. And, and all you want to do as a coach who's experienced this is like, is to, to help them get over that experience and just, uh, allow them to see, like, there's a time where you can't run. So you need to go out and run. get <laughs> and, and run. Um, but we can't, we can't save them. Right. And this is the very reason why, um, as coaches, we're guides, right. Yeah. We're guiding them along and we're sharing our experience, but when it comes down to it, they're going to have an experience and, and it's our responsibility to allow that to not allow it to happen, but to be there to guide them through it and, and allow them to experience the, the times when they could have run and they chose not to, because it all comes down to a choice. Yeah. Um, versus like every chance that you have to do what you love. And if that's running for most of us, get out there and run. And so do you, do you, with your athletes, and I'm just switching gears just briefly here. Do you, do you see that in them? Do you see um, chances for them to learn from, from experiences and you try to save them or do you, do, do you allow it more to happen and then just be there to, to help? It is, it is pretty hard, uh, as a coach and as a passionate guy, cause <laughs> I'm just like, uh, like, for example, uh, like just, uh, like up to the, like on the table, a quick example will be like the classic, uh, situation of no, I'm just not getting enough time and I have I have to do this for my family. I have to do this for my job. I have to do this, da, 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 da. And then, you, then my first question it is, okay, you have to do all this, but where is the time for you? Like, where is, where are you exactly? Like in all these plans that you have, it is amazing that you have all these commitments and responsibilities on the side. But if you really want to do this, like you need to find the time, like, uh, and I'm not asking to you to wake up at 3 AM to make a 45 minutes run or 20 minutes run actually. Cause if we so if somebody has this type of agenda, super busy, I won't give them more than 60 minutes a day. So, but then those 60 minutes becomes to 40 minutes and those 40 minutes becomes to 15 minutes and those 50 minutes become to zero and zero communication too. So in that zero communication, it is where all my tools have lo have finished, you know, like I have nothing else to bring to the table to really make you understand if you are doing this for the right reason or not. And it is quite of the hardest situation because some people will even think about it and say like, well, I pay you to coach me. And it is just like, yeah, but you pay me actually to guide you and to help you, not just to give you the training picks <laughs> thing. If that's the case, then you need to go and find a plan online and just follow it as you think will be the best, you know? And so it is pretty hard because then, for example, uh, uh, Jess and I, we were talking a couple of weeks ago about this, uh, that I started doing the meditation while I was recovering from the PRP. And... And I started putting it on training picks for Julie and sunrise meditation and stretching yoga, sunrise meditation, da, 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 da. and then, then after the second week that I put it there, now she put it for me. And I was telling Jess that I stressed a little bit out because I was just like, shit, this is like my, my spare time, you know, like 
what I wanted to decide, like if I want to do core, I will do core. If I want to stretch, I will stretch. If I want to do yoga, I'll do yoga. Like, you know, um, it is not like a structure that it, I want, like it has to, but it's, if it's in training peaks, I feel it like I have to, like, you know, so I, and then I started like, okay, sunrise meditation, okay, night meditation, or the, like switching a little bit things up. Where I wanted to go on this point, it's like I I saw it first tested on me to see how it improves a lot of my energy, my moods, um, the the actually how active I were, like not only just killing myself myself in the training, but also getting some quiet time on all this, and I started putting like meditation or maybe just and I'm, I'm not giving like just tell me like 20 to 30 to 40 minutes i'm just giving them 10 minutes meditation and i see everything green and then only the meditation it's it's red <laughs> which i'm completely i'm completely respectful to my athletes on that side but what i but my whole point on this it's like i'm just trying to create them a better habits uh where i know they can really improve from kind of an effortless moving of small pieces every single day. Um, cause, uh, and actually this is something that I was talking with my girlfriend in the morning, um, with one case that I was explaining to her, this athlete that I, it, it crossed my mind every single day. And I'm just like, how am I going to make it work like for him, you know? And then, and then she got to the point, like, if you need to keep being present for them to keep this happening, that's not right. Cause they are here with their purpose and their own way. They came here. You are not forcing anybody. Like your job is done to put training picks and do a follow up weekly or whatever you do. But if, if they are not doing it and they don't want it to, like you have no more space to work on, you know? And what I was telling her, it is that is it is like when you are studying or in at the university or college or whatever, and then you all semester all the semester you were just like doing whatever. And then one week before the test, you are just like freaking out. Like I'm gonna meditate six hours a day and I'm gonna <laughs> like stretch like even when I'm sleeping I'm gonna be stretching and I'm gonna be eating so clean and you know all this rush time of course it's, you're not gonna pass the test so you're gonna go and excuse my language but you're gonna go feel like shit in the race of course or you're gonna stress so much pre-race time because you want to do check all the boxes and it's too late already because you don't have the habit you know so yeah, I'm trying to get this to my athletes on the, to bring it to the table, but it's all up to them, you know, like it's something that we cannot force anybody actually. Yeah. And you know what, knowing you so well, Troy, and of course, knowing BJ so well, um, <laughs> you guys love what you do. You love your athletes. You care about your athletes. You want them to succeed. And it's got to be one of the hardest things for you guys when, you know, they're not getting the workouts in. So you go, okay, well, let's, you know, you get on the phone or you have a, an email conversation and you agree, okay, what, 60 minutes a day? Okay, yeah, I can do that. And then that doesn't happen. You keep dropping it down. And then and then I've seen this so many times. Um, and sometimes with people, you're like, wow, I, you know, I can't believe that person is not doing it. Um, yeah. But, and then it goes to zero and then there's no communication. And it's like... It's so heartbreak. I know it's like heartbreaking for BJ and I could imagine it's the same for you. So I guess my question for both of you guys is like, how do you let go of that? Like, what is your process to just let them have their process? Because it's not your job to save them. It is your job to guide them, to be there a hundred percent for them. So when they do come back, they don't need to be punished. You just pick up the momentum and you keep going. But how do you guys let go of just kind of that heartbreak of seeing someone dive down and not making time for themselves and their goals and their dreams. BJ first, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I've gone down the route of, of um, trying to save them. I've, and I've felt the emotions, the charge inside of, of, I can't believe they just, they did exactly what you said, Troy, and they just stopped um, or in your example, they, they started <laughs> late in the game, you know, right before the race, but I've seen, 
I've seen it happen where they, they're going so well and then the final month it, it, it disappears. So it's gone the other way. And, and you see, um, as Jess would say from the Awake Athlete Podcast, like from a 10,000 foot view, I've been able to see, like I see how they're progressing and I see what they're doing and achieving. And my heart and my, my love of this sport and love of the human will sees them so close to achieving what they want to achieve and then they self-sabotage. And, and there's numerous things they do to self-sabotage. But I've been that person that has felt the pull to save them. And with growth and experience, like we were talking about earlier with injury, like through experience, like actually experiencing those feelings, I've been able to, to separate myself from them. Yeah. So is it would I want a coach to save me or would I want a coach to let me struggle a bit with some guidance and then, and then have myself pull me back up because come race day, I'm the only person that's there. A coach is not there. Like I'm the only person that's on that course. Mm. And that's how I've framed it recently is I can't save them. I can yeah. guide them. I can give them, um, I can be the rumble strips on the road to keep them, keep them moving, <laughs> yeah. but, but I can't save them. And with that, with that detachment, I'm allowing myself to grow because I'm not, you know, nagging them. I'm not forcing my agenda on them, but I'm also allowing them to grow. And in their own time, they're going to come to a point where they're like, I see what he was telling me. I, I understand that. Like, it sucks enough for me now that I'm going to commit and do everything possible to, to make myself be there in my best come race day. So that's how, that's how I work through it. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts, Troy? Uh, for me, it is um, like I kind of have I I learn a lot of this from Siri actually, but it is more like uh, letting them do their things for a couple of days and then they come back and or or either I go touch base with them and then if I like if let's say if I try to touch base with them like five to three times in between there. And there's no answer, there's, there's no interest or there's no interaction, like, but they are still doing one or three or two sessions a week. Um, there are two things that I do. One, I put again that same week because I know it's, it won't affect them because it actually will help them because repetition is key, isn't it? <laughs> so, but the first thing it is that people or athletes will say like, Hey, what's going on? When you give me the same week, <laughs> like copy paste, it is like, mm, how you talk about it before you text me? <laughs> like, like, yeah, you're like, like I just, mm. I was up for three hours last night thinking about you. <laughs> no copy paste. And then you say copy paste, like, and then, well, I mean, I give them, I give them again the session. And if it's not there, like I just keep it like a little bit smoothly, um, unloading the sessions that's sessions wise or training wise, but like the attachment with them, like talking to them, helping them. Like I always try to be, um, and this is something also that, that we were saying Bali and I a couple of days ago, not long ago that. The coach has to be there sometimes to actually help solve the questions, the stress that it's around training or family wise or work wise. Not has to be the psychology, a psychology guy, a psychologist, but maybe like, for example, I had this athlete now with COVID. Um, he, he had to be at specific place and there was no place to train, no place for nothing. And he can only barely sometimes walk on the beach or maybe go for a swim every couple of times. And then he was so stressed because he was not going to be able to train, but he put down the training. He called me and he said, like, I'm not going to be able to train. So I'm not going to continue on this. But I knew how worried he was on this, that I keep contact him every single week to know how he was doing, like dealing with this situation. And then he will be like, Hey, Troy, you have, you are not going to believe it, but I went for a swim and saw dolphins and this and that and shall I lie. And I'm just like, there is actually your price that the, the universe or anything is paying to you to actually keep this active 
uh, living, moving, you know? So if he woke up at five, six, seven, or whatever time it is, and committed to go for a 40 minutes, 20 minutes swim, his joy was actually at that moment that saw the dolphin swimming. But if you are just thinking about like, no, I'm, I have no time, how, what I'm gonna do is too risky. I, I, how come I gonna swim outside here now? So back to the point of the athletes, it's like, I try to touch base with them if I know they are worried or they, they, even if I'm not really coaching them, like if I, like, so I had another athlete that she, she's on a study, uh, um, her degree and she was absolutely chaotic on her timings because everything was online and just like timings of like 7 a.m. till 11 p.m. like classes and everything. And he was just crazy about it. And I talked to her like, just find 10 minutes to even go walk around your neighbor in between your lessons or in between your homework or in between, just try to be like, not, not let yourself down on that side, you know? Mm-hmm. And if they keep going and uh, keep coming back to me, like, hey, I did this and this was great, thumbs up and thank you and shalala, I keep touching base with them and helping them even if I'm not coaching them because I'm not writing a program for them maybe, but I'm actually like kind of guiding them to keep it rolling a little bit out of the stress or whatever it is. But if, if there's miscommunication at all, I've just let them go. Like, as you say, I just, detach myself from that and if they come back they are more than welcome to come back of course uh but i find it a a, uh not a little bit so unrespectful to not say even goodbye or thank you you know yeah Um, i know it's it's surprising we we've experienced that as well um Okay, I want to, um, you uh, talked about meditation, you have started a practice, and I want to know, um, I want to know what, how you feel it has benefited you. So we've probably been doing it for what, like eight months December. or so? Okay, we so, in December. So nine months or so we've, you've been doing it? What? Everybody who's listening now, uh, nobody's <laughs> watching, just asking me this, that she gave me the evil eyes, like, evil eyes, like um, <laughs> I want you to talk about meditation, like how it's going. Like, when, like yes, you are on a test. On a public I want to post- know. Podcast. <laughs> I w- All right. I want to know if you're being consistent. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, like, well, uh, let's define consistent. Um, well, I think we defined consistent last time we talked, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but well, I'm just um, giving you a hard time. I'm giving you a hard no, time. You're like, amazing. For, first of all, I, I wanted to, to talk to talk about uh, what I said. Um, we we had the first podcast in 2017, and then I, I had to drive to the to the swimming uh, Patagon man. I was alone, and actually, I was kind of not panicking, but I was actually like getting having all these questions in my mind of saying what am I doing here? Like, what is going on in this? Like, how did I end up doing this race in the end of the world, literally? And like the water, the water it is like eight degrees. And I was like, kind of like trying to touch my roots again, to touch base. And then I don't know how, but I find out like something in, in the podcast and I was just like, I'm going to listen it to, to the podcast again. So I went uh, to this swim and it was like hour and a half. Listening to all the podcasts, uh, the podcast that we did. And actually that was like kind of a rebound to myself to say like, okay, now I, 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 I can, I kind of remember where was the old Troy and where, where I started, what I wanted to become, what I wanted to do. And actually it was like a completely like full energy to me to say like, we are here to actually to keep following what we've been doing for the last six, seven, eight, nine years. So, um, with that said, uh, before that we talk, Jess, and I, I remember that I asked you to help me with the meditation part, cause I felt that it's been something in the back of my mind for so many years, actually. 
but never took it seriously to say like, okay, I'm going to do it right now. And I did it in the way that I should have not do it. And I called you three days before the race <laughs> and told you <laughs> that, that, that I wanted to meditate and so you will thought, be helpful for my you race. You thought about it for 10 years and then you decided to do it three days before the race. It was perfect though. It was, Pro it was perfect. It was perfect, actually. Um, probably wasn't 10 years, but maybe three to four years okay. was in the back of my mind. But well, I, we, we talk and then you, you teach me how, how to breathe and how to start focusing on nothing and start working on my mantra and just like actually learning how to be present. And mm. Without that, actually, like there was so many different moments in the race in Patagon Man where I was panicking at all, like uh, so many different things. The water was freezing, like absolutely freezing. The bike was absolutely the uh, big, big challenge road. And then the run was just the cherry on top. But um, so about meditation, it's been like, I think like we said, uh, and I think BJ and I, we talk about this, uh, in a message on Instagram or something else that we were saying that it's been a chaos around and it's been, everything's been a little bit hectic and maybe not with us, but with the things that it's happening around. And if we don't try to find that calm that we want to be, or want to find, uh, we are not, we are never going to find it. So, um, it's the way that I'm working on to find the calm that I'm looking to. And it's, it's hard to be consistent because as you said, um, it is maybe there's always that, like you told me the day we talk that that is not nego negotiable. Like it is also, <laughs> it is just like, it has to be. And it's in, yeah. and I use the same reference as my, as I do with my athletes, like, come on, you don't have 10 minutes to sit down and breathe. Like, it, like to be, it might sound dramatic, but it is like, if you don't have 10 minutes to sit down and, and breathe literally, like you have maybe nothing like, like it is just the rush of timing, you know? So, um, translated to training, translated to, to racing. I have like, for example, in, in Patagon, man, what I had it is like, there was this momentum I catch, uh, now it is a good friend of mine, but in the race, he wasn't, <laughs> uh, uh, I catch this guy like, well, one night before we were having dinner or two days before, uh, Tim Don and I, we were having dinner and we were like, well, okay. So it's the two of us and who else is coming? Like, do you know somebody we have to take care of it? Like we <laughs> need to be careful. What are we going to do? Like, and Tim mentions that there is this, this guy um, with last name of an animal. And I was just like, I don't know who is him. And then this just, uh, I was just like, it, it stuck, it got stuck in my mind. And then when I was running, I saw this guy, well, he passed me on the bike. And when he passed me since that moment to be honest, like, there's where like kind of my meditation took place in the racing. Cause when he passed me and he looked at me actually, he looked really, really smashed. Like he was suffering right there. And since I saw, and since I knew he was coming, I started just to breathe and actually just taking it easy, like easy, easy, easy. And actually decreeing to saying like today, you might gonna pass me right now, but it's not gonna be the day. Like you are not gonna win today. You know, like I, I was just like affirmating, getting these affirmations in my mind, like all the way. Um, and I knew he was coming because my support car got me like 15 minutes before and he was like, he's 15 minutes back. Okay. 15 minutes. Fair enough. Then 10 minutes, then eight minutes and six minutes. And then they got to me and they got by me and then they say like, he's just right behind you. And I was just like, Shh, okay, okay. Let's, let's keep it up. Like, and then. I got a flat tire and right, right after he passed me, I got a flat tire and it started to get into this chaos. And all the time I was just practically breathing and really, really focusing in the momentum being present. But that's not like the biggest experience of 
my meditation took me. Actually, it was in the kilometer of maybe 25 to 27 during the marathon. And I, I told you this already, yes, but there was this momentum. I catch uh, Conejo, Conejeros, at uh, the kilometer maybe 13 to 16. In between there, we are not sure there. He says he was the 15, I say he was the 12, like, we don't know. And when I catch him, uh, we run from that kilometer till the 42 together. Is that, the, was, guy who, is that the guy who passed you on the bike? Yeah. Okay. So, and when I was running, when I was catching him, every eight, well, every people that I cross on the marathon, they were telling me he was a little bit farther away. When I left the T, the T2, they told me it was eight minutes ahead. And when I pass uh, some river, there was a photographer there and he was like, oh yeah, he's like 15 minutes ahead of you. I was just like, what is this guy doing? Like, is he on a bike or what is happening here? Like, <laughs> this is not real. And then the next guy, he was like, no, no, no. He's like just 10 minutes ahead. So I was just like, so confusing, catch him. And then from there, we start running together the whole rest, the rest of the marathon. And then there was a part where he was just attacking the uphills. And then I was just attacking the, the, the flat. Then he attacks the uphills and then, and I was surviving uh, behind him, but I was starting getting out of my zone and actually out of my control pace and everything. And before i I really realized this, I started to catch my breath again and just like, just keep running, keep flowing, keep running, keep flowing, keep running, keep flowing. And really started working with the mantra. And after this, I actually started really working with my breathing. And I told Jess that there's, there was a part where practically I don't really remember much of what I was doing while running, but I was, I remember perfectly just, you know, these videos where you can see the GoPro, but you don't see the, the noises of anything actually not feeling because you are not there, of course. But that was a momentum where I was just like, if I remember, like, I don't know how long it was, like one, one minute, like whatever was it, one second, 10 seconds. But that was actually the part where I felt absolutely in control and said like, this is mine. Like, I got this. Like, um, so it was kind of the same experience that I experienced the day, the three days before that I was practicing. Uh, <laughs> while, while learning how to breathe. So when I, when I got into that point, actually, I don't know, but I think after that, I was just more like, okay, I think I know where I am. I feel where I'm going and this is in my hands. Like it's absolutely in my control. So it's been like, actually it's been changing a lot of things for me, the, the meditation, and it is something that have changed my mind. When, that is amazing. And you ended up second that day to Tim Don, right? Didn't Tim yeah. win? That's amazing. Yeah. And you guys are friends? Yeah, the, the three <laughs> of us, we are friends. Well, Conejo and I, we are friends, and Tim and I, we are good friends too. <laughs> awesome. That's, I'm so glad you talked about that because Patagonia Man was your last race, wasn't it? No, Campeche. Oh, Campeche that's right. was my last race, yeah. That's right. You eked out a race in 2020, didn't you? Yeah, I got it. Yeah. It is there. <laughs> Good. Um, Not all right. so many can say that. Should we, switch, should we switch gears again? Talk about a little bit about nutrition? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So sure. I was, um, well, first of all, I want to give a little plug to your YouTube channel. You started putting up some really cool videos uh, about three or four months ago. And I watched the latest one today and it was like all vegetables. And you were talking about <laughs> how you can mix in tofu and tempeh and lentils. And it looked amazing. But um, so are you eating more? Are you, are you shifting more to a plant-based diet? And how does that feel? Well, um, the, the plant-based part, it started like before Patagon Man, I had this little uh, question in the back of my mind, went to talk to my nutritionist, Julia Nunez. And when we talked, she was like, definitely should be great to test, but not now because you have a big race right now and we don't know how it's going to happen. And the whole race scenario is something new. Like, <laughs> like you haven't raced at, at this uh, format or I don't know, type of race. 
so we put it on hold and then from there actually i never eat much uh animal products like it is just barely some couple of things but right now uh, after the prp uh we did a, we did some tests and then she says like I, you have so much um you are so swallow how you say it like um like like, like in, in, inflammation inflammation yeah. yeah so she's like um i think this is something to be related with the with your actually with your with your tbl's problem mm -hmm. so let's give it a test uh to switch to plant based and then i was just like inside of me i was just like yes finally like uh, like i wanted to do it uh, uh this test since long time ago but then i we started like well after the prp i got it to start with my new menu that as she called it and it was just so hard to really think on my plates of like for example because i even that i don't eat red, red meat it's like some couple of eggs or maybe cheese for example i'm cheese lover since ever like always and it was so hard like okay then i might i, I might want to uh, like actually my girlfriend was just like shit you're not gonna be able to eat quesadillas what are you gonna do like <laughs> i don't think you're gonna survive like i'll give you two weeks <laughs> and i was just like and actually i was like a game on yeah, you know challenge. i was just like yeah. Mm, okay and then i was just like wanted to make my quesadillas and i was just like no 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 back to the plant base so julia started to make this plan on base uh, like it's plant based but not fully plant based you know it is a little bit of changes in between for example um some cheese i'm able to eat like uh mozzarella but like uh like the old cheese like not fresh cheese and goat cheese also and and parmesan that's it but i have like not more than 20 grams a day of one of those uh so it's not fully plant-based but it is um practically the base of the nutrition part it is plant-based i don't need any protein from animal and it's been great actually um it, it was hard actually the transition was pretty hard even that i eat pre, 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 pretty clean it was like um for example it doesn't change much the plant-based to what i used to do what you saw on the video it is uh you, you might just add maybe salmon or some tuna or different animal protein but right now that's on hold and changing it for maybe tofu or tempeh and actually a lot of hummus uh i i buy the hummus now in 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 costco uh like these huge hummus and never last and so it's been great i like it a lot um i don't know for example, it will be pretty interesting and I need to, to, to you guys help me with the guidance of how you travel to keep actually like the plant base with the right nutrition because or nutrients because that's like kind of my biggest concern when we start moving out of, of where we are right now. How am I going to be able to handle this? Because this weekend, past weekend, I was at my sister's and it was just so hard to eat like with them because everything had uh, eggs or milk or you know mm. so it was just quite hard but but it's been feeling great energy wise it's feeling amazing uh the first couple of weeks was hard to adapt the body i had i had a lot of headaches um mm. and i was so sleepy the first days actually too which Julia says is something good to happen because it means that the detox, it's been a little bit more deep, she says. Um, but the impressive part or the good part, it is that my training, it is not affected at all from anything changes that have changed. A little bit, the heart rate, it's been a little bit up um, than used to, but I think it's also a little bit of fitness because I stopped after the PRP. So it's a little bit of a combination. And yeah, I think I, I need to learn a lot because um, I have a chance to eat this bread, like the sour bread, like kind of 
free amount a day, but I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> Does that have, but like sourdough bread, that shouldn't, that should be vegan, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but yeah, you but just can't eat bread. No, what I mean is that I cannot stop eating You can't bread. stop eating oh, bread. Gotcha. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm, yeah, well, totally. Last night we had Oh, my that. gosh. Yeah, last night we ate a loaf of bread. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> so we... Yeah, so she told me, buy this bread, and it's going to last two weeks. It didn't got even to Wednesday. Well, sourdough and sourdough bread is Usually is kind like of the, the best kind of bread yeah. for you to eat um, for digestion and and all of that. But um, so we'll we'll be no help in the bread department. But I mean, Troy, you know you know that we will be there for you, whatever you need. Um, we'll give you all our tricks. We will share them all with you, and make Thank sure you so that much. that you are fueled. Um, I've got one more question, BJ. Do you want to say anything before we wrap it up? Yeah, so we kind of. I mean, you haven't been there's no races going on right now. So I yeah. just want to know, like, um, what's your motivation right now? Not with the unknown. Is it just to be better? Um, it is actually just to keep growing, to keep learning, um, to be better, but not just being faster, you know, like, uh, uh, cause people will relate it. I'm getting better cause I'm getting faster. And actually, like I, I, I was listening to the podcast. Uh, I, I listened it first to, I forgot his name, the teacher meditator. Oh, um, David, David, David G. G. David G. It yeah. was just amazing. I gave it to, to all my athletes, <laughs> sent it to them. And so everybody loved it. Like, it's just like, I think we need more humans like him. Of yeah. Course. So cool. Yeah. And then I listened it to the, to, to Mark Allen's podcast a couple of days ago, actually, while I was running and the story of the uphill part, it is, I, I think it is just the best example of where we are at right now. You know, um, if he was a world championship, but he never rushed the pre off season of getting that hill, barely walking, barely jogging, barely running, eventually sprinting up the hill with the same heart rate. Um, I think it is just the best uh, space and time to learn how your body works, you know? Like actually, and actually I think he mentions this. Uh, I don't know how that sounds so natural for me, but maybe because I hear it. <laughs> and, 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 and actually spend that time to, to really think, okay, my heart rate is this and here. And my power, if you are working with power mirror, it is here. My swim stroke here is looking like this. Like there is no rush. And my motivation is actually that. Like um, keep learning of how I can be more efficient in all the three disciplines, actually outside of training too, or how I can recover uh, nutrition wise, how I can keep like taking the right nutri nutrients, and my protein, whatever it is. Um, so I feel it is that uh, my my drive right now, like it is. And actually, maybe I don't see it that clear, but in the end of the road or at the end of the road, I can practically see or know that whenever this ends or change or we get the actually the, the opportunity to race again, we're going to be able to race, not to go and play again, you know, and so that's kind of my biggest motivation on, on that side, because I know everything is going to pass eventually. And if not, we will find something else to keep moving. You know, like I, I, I feel pretty calm that there is no races. I have no rush at all. Like I've, I, I like the, the now, you know, like I like going out for my trainings, a good instructor behind because Julie has been doing an amazing job there and following this and actually knowing that we are going to be ready. So that's kind of my, my motivation. Nice. And your motto, which follows you everywhere. And I think leads you everywhere is be relentless. And what does that mean? Like, what does it mean to you to be relentless? Well, um, I got it from, from the book of, I forgot his name. He is Chris Grover. I think it is. Um, and he, he used to be the, the mental coach and the, uh, the athlete management of Michael Jordan and who else? I think, um, 
this golf player, I'm pretty bad with names, um, uh, Tiger Woods too. Um, he, he, his name uh, of the, the name of the book actually is Relentless. Um, from there, it, it got my attention because I didn't know anything related to what it is or what it was at that moment. And then I, I ordered the book and started reading it. And I think I have read it at least four times or five. <laughs> and it's always, it always has something else new to bring to the table to, to learn about what is or how you act when you are rel relentless. I think somebody else or a lot of people um, gets confused with resilience. And it is quite not the same actually, but um, relentless, at least how I translate it or how I see it in my life, it is actually to do the best of what you can where you are with what you have, like at any single different situations. Like uh, if somebody is maybe um, pissed while you are driving and they are just yelling at you shall blah, 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 and you actually have you have no control of them of course but you have control of you like and that's actually you can be relentless at that moment of saying like okay whatever let's move on and just keep going or just keep going with the arguments or whatever you want to do so actually and then something else that actually Siri teach me was um like the effort and attitude, and we talk about this in the past uh, podcast, actually. So I related, uh, like I was reading this book, and then when I get, got to the training session, uh, there was, I having a really rough time one of those days in the pool, and then she talked to me and she was like, Troy, you look like shit, literally, like you're swimming so bad today, but come on, you got this. You just got control of your effort and attitude. Just control it and be present. Like, come on, get it, get it. Like, it doesn't matter if you don't get the interval, but just keep going, please. So that was like kind of the fusion at the time where it, it got like the action and reaction of saying like, this is what I'm reading actually. And this is actually what I'm experiencing here in the training day. And actually that's, for me it is, my mantra, my, my, my everything, because it's not only about being relentless in training, racing, or anything. It is about how you act at any kind of situation that you have. I love it. That's perfect. Perfect place to end. Thank you so much, Troy. Uh, loved having you here. Love you. You're like a brother. Thank and you uh, anything we can do to support you, you know you can always reach out. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it.